No, you can you can go if you if you're ready. It's fine. Uh, let's start with someone Hi, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen anyone of you, maybe a couple of other faces. But... Um, so, my name is Olga, and I'm a board member of the association that's behind RGB, and we've been doing that since 2019. And I'm also the founder of Pandora Prime Company, which I will be talking about a bit later. First question just to understand who. I'm talking to you. Who knows what Bitcoin is? <laughs> okay. Who is coming from blockchain world? It, don't be shy. It's okay. <laughs> Everyone has its past. It's fine. <laughs> Everyone is just Um Who knows what RGB is? That's a good way. Okay. Yeah. That's a good start, actually. Okay. So, um, I will today give a brief overview of what RGB is, how it works, no technical details, if you want to like, just go in the depth of the technology, you have Maxim Orlovsky here, he is the person who basically is responsible for all the architectural nightmare <laughs> that people are complaining about, that RGB is too complex, it's hard to understand and stuff, so if you have any technical questions, he is the person you can attack. Uh, I'm just the talking head. <laughs> so, um, I will start with a disclaimer that some things might be pretty offensive here, and it, this presentation is indeed not like politically correct, and it's not for people under age or pregnant, hysterical, <laughs> vote-related people as well. So, I'm not responsible for any reaction that you might ever have after this. So this is the agenda. I will briefly talk about why we need RGB, what it is, what it's not, which is also very important, and what RGB can do, when you can use it, uh, who does it and how, and basically if you want to get involved, how you can do it. So part one, why do we need RGB? Um, back in the day, when Bitcoin uh, happened, basically, and especially after Ethereum happened, there became, um, there happened this notion of complex smart contracts that would help people to gain their own sovereignty, to help them create proper money, to help them stay uh, individuals, not to depend on any third parties, etc. Et so basically the expectation was something like this. A pack of wolves having their own agenda, having their own powers, having their own money, and basically following whatever the will they have. In reality, as we all probably saw, especially with the Ethereum world, we received this. Why? Because there were many compromises done in the process of achieving the goals. The goals were very really humble. The goals were very, really, very good. But the methods of achieving the goals and the technological infrastructure was very poor. So basically, from this, in theory, we became this in practice. We don't have censorship resistance in current uh, blockchain-based technologies. We don't have, we always have some third parties, exchanges or middlemen that could still move our cryptocurrencies back and forth, etc. etc. So eventually we didn't reach the established goal. So, um, one of the most important parts of self sovereignty is indeed money. And yes, there is the notion of fixing money, fix the world. And Many people, many projects have been trying to do it. But again, we have different things here. We have the expectation and the goals and the claims, and we have the reality of what we need to deal with right now, basically on a daily basis. So the expectation was that, uh, actually we have a friend and he told me that uh, it would be a very good uh, drinking game to drink a, a shot every time they see a word kill on my slide. <laughs> so probably already here, everyone just get wasted. <laughs> so the expectation was, 
that we, as sovereign and smart people, will give birth to technology and to money that will kill the banks, that will eliminate centralized exchanges, that will create assets that will not be owned by a third party, this is why, and thus this third party will never have the ability to screw you over. Um, we will not have tokens that would create some bullshit. We will have tokens of uh, meaningful tokens. Uh, that would be the best way to put it. But again, in reality, with all the trade-offs, all the compromises, that we as developers, as business owners, as, as users even, took, we have uh, solution. We do have solutions to um, the current broken financial system, but those solutions are not secure, and especially back in the day and even now, we can see a lot of hacks happening everywhere, at any level, hardware wallets, signing, de which is signing devices basically. Uh, software wallets on application by value applications, desktop ones, uh, centralized exchanges, bridges, everywhere. Um, if we talk about, for example, blockchains, we probably all remember the story about the crypto keys. Well, just a very fun, seemingly project just came out and it broke the whole financial and other parts of the infrastructure of Ethereum. Which was pretty huge at that point already. But still, one crypto kitty managed to kill that. Um, of course, right now, if we were to talk about DeFi especially, the transaction costs are very high. And basically, it's focused not on meaningful transactions between people, but more on speculation, getting yields, and all that. And the question arises here, like, yes, okay, but we're Bitcoiners, right? So we, we have Bitcoin, and that's our core. We're not into this DeFi space. We're doing something better, we're doing something more solid. Why do we even care about DeFi? Why do we even care about the chaos that's happening in the blockchain world? And the, the issue here is that DeFi is not the right thing. DeFi as a concept is not a bad thing, so we need to care about what's happening in the Ethereum world. We need to see how they fail. We need to see and learn how exactly not to build the solutions and understand why the solutions that they have, for example, they don't work. Because there are also very smart people working there, like really. They are cryptographers, they're trying to do zero-knowledge stuff, they're trying to do scalable stuff. But all of them fail. And for us, because finance is not just Bitcoin, you cannot have financial systems having only Bitcoin. You actually need to expand it. There are so many use cases and we need Bitcoin finance. We need the financial ecosystem in Bitcoin and based on Bitcoin. Um, what I mean by financial systems? I mean, all the tools and technologies that are required for at least these four um, industries, I'll call it industries. Uh, it it um, involves trading, it involves lending, NFTs, NFTs not in terms of tokens of crypto kitties or something like that, but NFTs NFTs actually are a very valid use case because NFTs allow artists, music creators, content creators to actually re remain, retain their ownership over the production, over their intellectual property, and still gain money out of it. Distribute, but not give the rights for others to copy paste it without even saying thank you. So for me, NFT is much more than doggies, kitties, and all other animals. And of course, the uh, DAO. The DAO use case is also very important because um, it allows the legal arbitrage, and basically you don't depend, you, you with the DAO, with properly structured and properly implemented DAO, you can create um, a community of people binded together but still working as separate agents. Not depending on each other, but cooperating together, which is very different. 
So in Bitcoin and for us as individuals, we do need all of this. The question is just how to build it. So looking at the blockchain ecosystem flaws, we, we came to the conclusion that the solution is needed. And the solution should be a smart contract system, which should be very private, but still verifiable. So there should not be a question of trust, whether you tr must trust the second party, but the question is rather, how can you verify whether this party is screwing you up or not? Because you don't need to trust someone as long as you are sure that the person or this organization, they don't have any means to actually commit any fraud against you. And this is very important. Um, also, one of the important things is that the system needs to be resistant to censorship, but still open for fair participation. And it should be scalable. And it should be fast. So basically, all of this, especially this one, resistance to censorship, is absolutely... Was, it actually was one of the main and fatal trade-offs that the Ethereum community made back in the days. They based their technologies on trusting each other, on collective voting, on collective uh, deliberately giving up the power of the individual to some DAO, to some structure, to some organization. And they also didn't have the protocols and the technologies that would provide the censorship resistance on the technological layer. Now, we are proud to say that we do have the solution, the proper solution to all of those problems and to all of those use cases. And that solution is called RGB. So, first question, easy, what is RGB? So RGB is a very scalable and what is, what is important to a complete smart contract system for Bitcoin, which is able to work with Bitcoin and with Lightning Network. It's zero knowledge based, meaning that it's extremely private and it has extremely strong privacy assumptions. When people ask, so how old is RGB? It's um, not so, it's very easy, I think, still to answer the question. And the question is, it's actually pretty old, because the concept started in 2016 and then it, uh, in 2019, where, uh, when Maxime joined the team with Giacomo Zucco and, they, and we established the LWDP Association, uh, the concept of RGB was rethought, because it started as, let's do tokens over lightning. And then Maxime, with his brain says he can do it, joined the team and he understood the potential of the technology. He understood that there is much more than money to this. There is much that what, what the world actually needs is not another token protocol. It's a fully fledged and private smart contract system. Um, so what is RGB? RGB is a smart contract system. It doesn't have any native token or whatever. It doesn't have any gas, anything like that. It's extremely private. It's so far the only technology that actually works with the Lightning Network. Uh, it's blockchain agnostic, meaning that um, as a base layer, as the commitment layer, you can use Bitcoin, you can use any blockchain, you can use basically anything, even the newspaper. Um, important to notice here is the definition of a smart contract, because especially now, from what I see, uh, even ordinals claim that they are smart contracts protocol, which is kind of true and not at the same time. Uh, so we define a uh, smart contract as the way to enforce the fulfillment of a certain agreement between humans without an external centralized agency that will enforce people to actually uh, do what they agree to do. It includes military, government, court, whatever, and whatnot. Um, RGB is the only system that works with these paradigms at core. At core. The first one and the most important one is the client-side validation, meaning that all the data, all the asset is stored on the client side. If you own the asset, you know about its existence, you can verify the information about it, you can transfer it. If you have the proper rights, you can reissue it, etc. Et but 
unless the information is deliberately exposed uh, to the public, no one else in the world will ever even know that the asset exists. And that's basically the concept. Like by that, by that, we're bringing back the really old concept of bear rights. So RGB is also a bear rights system. Um, the second paradigm that RGB is using is the single use use, and it's a mechanism to prevent the double spend. And of course, we're using cryptographic commitments and strict encoding in order to um, not if not load the underlying level, the blockchain in our case, or, or lightning channels, and to make the system private. Um, here's a link. You can make it photos or see on the video afterwards. And uh, read up on the paradigms after the talk. So, uh, briefly and on the very, very high level, this is the client side data. We call it stash. It's basically everything that you know about the asset. It's the ticker, it's the name, it's the amount, like how many of the assets were issued, who was the issuer, etc., etc. If that information is public, uh, if, if, you, if it's provided. And this dash uh, and the information, if you want to transfer the asset from, one, from yourself to someone else, you can commit the information into either lightning channels, which makes her to be layer three, as people call it, technology, or you can use blockchain as the commitment medium, which makes RGB layer two technology. Um, very important to notice here what RGB is not. RGB is not a token protocol. We have been talking and mentioning this over and over again for many years. RGB is not just about tokens anymore. It never, it never has been since 2008. RGB is not a sidechain, it's not a blockchain, it's not a rollup, and it's not a network. Because sometimes RGB gets um, compared to Lightning Network, and no. Unfortunately or fortunately, if you're trying to understand RGB through the prism of how Lightning Network works, or even how Bitcoin works, you will fail. RGB is a new beast, and you actually need to start learning about it from scratch. Um, everyone tells me that like, every time I try to explain what RGB is, most of the people just don't believe that things like this is possible. Yet, magically or not, actually not, but it is possible. So coming back to the question of Bitcoin finance, and building the sovereign finance for individuals. How can we do that with RGB? Um, in RGB, in this association, we have three components of how we can achieve that and build it, build the Bitcoin finance. The first one is the RGB, is the smart contract system. The second one is Bfrost, is basically an extension to the Lightning Network. Because current Lightning Network and its architecture, they, it's not as robust as, and it's not as private, and it's actually not as agile as we need it to be for the Bitcoin finance, because Bitcoin finance is a very complex notion, because it includes a lot of things like this, and DEX, um, liquidity pools, IMM, features, options, all this is a very complex system. This is why they need to have something very robust in the and last but not least, we have a storm protocol. It's the data network and global state carrier, basically. And storm, uh, the name storm comes from storage and messaging. And this is the uh, protocol that we are using for storing. That it's work for in progress right now, but we are still using it already um, to store the stash and the data on the assets and to transfer them through the messaging channels. What we have from the perspective of software, four core concepts, because we have much more than this. So there are four nodes that allow us to do everything that I described before. The first one is the RGB node for the smart contracts. The second one is the BP node. It's this one is basically Bitcoin level thing. Even if you just cross everything else, you can use this just for your Bitcoin stuff. 
for the identity value RGB. So VK node is the Bitcoin indexing node. It's uh, faster and much more efficient than uh, Electric server. We have the LNP node, is the uh, Lightning node implementation that we have. It's fully in Rust and it supports uh, DAX functionality, top root, uh, RGB, future B5, and everything like that. And finally, the storm node for the storage messaging, messaging and, and, uh, and search. Answering the question of which level technology RGB is. <laughs> Any and none, I want to say, because in very specific situations, RGB is actually orthogonal even, both to Lightning Network and to Bitcoin. And the person responsible for this, uh, even for this triangle, is sitting right here. So if you have mm -hmm. any questions, <laughs> so if you have any questions on how exactly he came up with the architecture like that, please come over, ask questions afterwards. Um, making a step back, is there anything else besides Bitcoin finance that I can do with RGB? Yes. There are actually many things that you can do. You can do assets, of course. You can do a lot of gaming stuff, uh, collectibles. You can create digital art and tokenize it and then sell it, still maintaining the authorship right. Uh, you can do voting systems. You can do DAOs. Very private, very secure, very robust, and very scalable, which is also very important. And things like digital identities, roaming profiles, key management, that's also possible to do with RGB. When RGB? Because you saw the like huge history slide, so we have been building this for quite a few years. It's there. The good thing is that it's there. So, one of the first um, most stable, I want to say, releases that we had, it was the version 8, 0 0.8. It was released in uh, June last year, so one year ago. And basically, for those of you who already wanted to build stuff on RGB or play around with it, you could use it for the past year already. But for those of you who want to build, to start, start building it now, we have this release, 0 0.10, which is even better. 0 0.10 has, we have been working on it for many months, and it does have consensus breaking changes with, uh, if we compare it to the 0 0.8 version. But um, the architecture, the tooling that we provide with this release are much more robust and comprehensive. So basically right now, we can say that we do have everything for wallet developers, for business owners, for content creators to start building on RGB. And we hope that there will be no consensus breaking changes after this, leading to freezing of RGB development within the following years. So the bug fixing will be there, but this is the RGB version that will be released. And probably this is the RGB version that people would use for mainnet stuff. So, question who built RGB? Who is behind the RGB? Um, RGB in 2019, uh, so in 2019, we established the non profit in Switzerland called LPBP Standards Association. Um, right now, it's the largest Bitcoin technical non profit in Switzerland, which we are very proud of. And we have right now, I think, up to 70 contributors which is pretty huge. Um, if you want to support, you can use Kaser. Uh, this is the Lightning address. If you want to support, you know someone who would be interested in supporting and donating, you can also go to the LNPVP Standards Association website, and there will be our VTC Pay server link. It's not much. And one more thing. We, when we started working on RGB, we understood that making a bet fully that uh, on, some, on the notion that community will understand and support RGB development to the extent that we might need it was probably wrong. So, as crazy as we are, we established a for-profit association, Maxim and I, and 
In hmm? non profit. For profit. Company. 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 And we call it DB5 company because we're the first ones, the most reckless one, ones probably, who started already using our own products, our own software with RTD. So this is basically how it works. We have the open source standards, libraries, and everything at the level of LMPBP Association, and we have services, products, tools in the in Pandora company. One of the probably most Famous ones uh, from our product is my Citadel wallet. It's the first RGB wallet that was ever released. We released it two years ago, first one, first version. Yeah. And right now we have two versions of them. Uh, the first is the desktop wallet. Currently it's a Bitcoin only wallet, but it already has functionality that is not even on Bitcoin level, it's not present in any other wallet. For example, the dynamic time lock multisigs, which are which can create very complex setups, which are required for companies, corporate asset management, for family asset management, or even for your private management when you have, for example, 15 signing devices, three laptops, and you never understand where to use which one. That's the problem. That's the scope of problems that Mercedes is actually uh, solving. And of course, we are adding right now the support for the uh, 0.10 release of RGB, and it will be done within the following couple of weeks. So we are very excited about it. Uh, next, uh, we understood that there is a huge demand for a more programmable Bitcoin, and. The other, the second product of ours would be the RGB Red Bitcoin, which will have decentralized issuance, which is one of the biggest concerns for every user out there. It will bring a lot of programmability to Bitcoin. It will, it will be extremely private, and it will be the foundation for building further DeFi products, both for our company and for many other companies that have been working with RGB. We are also uh, in talks about with partners to issue the uh, digital Swiss franc, Swiss franc, which can be a killer feature, especially for this region, because there has been a lot of talks about the need of a private. First of all, they need to bring back the notion of Switzerland as the most private and secure asset management country. So we are bringing that notion back home. If you want to read more about RGB. This is the not exhaustive, but list of um, channels, chats, and websites that you can use. Right now we have more than 20 websites that you can actually go to and learn about RGB, try products, etc. But this is a great place to start and send to your friends. Thank you. <laughs> That's it for now. I hope I managed to answer at least some questions and not to confuse. And raise more. <laughs> and raise, yeah. Exactly, exactly. I had a disclaimer for a reason. <laughs> if you have any questions, you can throw them. Uh, just, uh, thank you. Could you explain a little bit more how the Swiss constant coin uh, would work? Uh, With the RGB? From the technical point of view? Yeah, just just an idea about how it works. From the technical point of view. Yeah, well, uh, I think that the question is how it will be backed and it will be backed yeah, exactly. by the franc. By so the Swiss will be, uh, yeah. bank based Swiss franc with yeah. a digital token being present in RGB. So it's not it's nothing uh, decentralized or nothing in that sort, but what it allows is to start uh, getting an adoption in the real economy. Because uh, what is important is that the speed of lightning network allows retail, uh, retail 
using the retail without high fees and without waiting 10 minutes for confirmation. Mm-hmm. And uh, without, well, else is more. yeah, and without uh, like even you use a Swiss franc with Ethereum, it will still have a high fees. Mm-hmm. Here, all these things are solved because of the Lightning Network. So that's the idea: how to start building adoption around the Lightning Network mm-hmm. with uh, some uh, stable coin that can be used by the merchants. So. Yeah, Swiss franc is centralized, so the, 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 the tag in this case will be centralized because mm-hmm. there is no reason to try to do it decentralized. But uh, it would be a temporary solution which can help with the bootstrapping the, the use of the technology. And also Switzerland itself is the country that is probably most open to crypto space, to experiments in the world right now. So, and we're based here. So it would be not wise to not take this advantage and not try to leverage it and use it and prove that the technology that we built can actually work in the real life. So you, you will, will patronize with a financial institution? Or? Uh, we're working with a canton of New Chateau and this okay. uh, to get it done. Well, still a lot of work to do, yes. That's a big thing. Well, there, there was already a digital Swiss franc made by Bitcoin Swiss, for instance, on yes. Ethereum, Ethereum, Atlantic. And there were some yes. issues with this, like, uh, there was a negative interest rate back in the days, meaning that it was impossible to... Maintain. ...to maintain it. Uh, now it's not the case, so... Now they Eventually, just froze. this time it's my worst. But, but I don't understand how. I mean, okay, it's, the, it's a canton, so it's not a classical institution like a, just a private, just a privately held bank. Um, but given that recently the um, Finma reduced um, the limits, you can uh, convert an on without, without KYC to crypto from a thousand a, mo- uh, a day to a thousand a month. And um, BT is going to, I think they're going to fight this in, in court. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not I, I wonder... they, have been, they have been fighting this over the past, over the past, I think, two or three years already. Right, but I think they have they're... been trying this to push this into mm-hmm. action for many years. And BT is fighting that, but. But um, I'm really curious and I'm really um, excited at the possibility that some institutions will say, okay, we're just going to issue uh, 20 minutes of strengths and uh, they're going to be. Uh, Monero style untraceable, <laughs> just floating around. Uh, that, that's, that's about that's, moving from fiat to crypto. So it's not about, it would be a question of the issuer, in this case the bank, how they will prove the source of the funds. But mm-hmm. because they use all their own funds, it's not the problem. And when people will be buying uh, Swiss franc for Bitcoin, it's also not a problem. There is no limit. Where the limit is, is when the people will try to buy a digital Swiss franc for a real Swiss franc. Mm-hmm. That's where would be the narrow thing. And that's where that limit would apply. But 1,000, like, it's really bad, that regulation, but it wouldn't prevent the adoption because it would be a millions of, like, potential millions of people buying that with this limit. So it's mm-hmm. not a limitation to the each year. It's a limitation for moving between crypto and non-crypto. Mm-hmm. And actually, in this case, having digital Swiss training may, might change the perception of crypto in FEMA's mind also, because they basically have an option to embrace this, gain more money, gain more traction, have Switzerland becoming more fancy and more open to the foreign capital, etc., etc. So it's their profits, basically. Mm-hmm. So... Mm-hmm. They have a very egoistic interest there as well. And hopefully it will also backfire in a good way for us, our people. I hope it works. <laughs> we hope so too. I have a question about the client side validation. I'm still struggling to, to understand the, the paradigm there. So it's like when I want to issue a token or something with RGB. I have to run the server where the data will be about this the amount, the, the, issue, the number of tokens, or it's just like it's the client that will validate the, the data, get, scrapping the, the data from the blockchain, become blockchain or writing. Uh, perhaps you don't need the server. Uh, 
you can do that without the sermon. And the second, the easiest way of understanding it is probably taking analogy with uh, uh, paper certificates, like share certificates, all these bare right instruments that were back in the days. So if I give you uh, shares of some BDI company on paper, how you verify that? Well, you don't need to run the server. The only thing that we need to do is in the moment when you would like to accept them, which would be non-interactive even, you need to read what's written there, check the signature, and come to the Feel conclusion. The paper, whether it's valid or not. Okay. Come to the conclusion, are you fine with that or not? And it's your decision. And this, this is the kind of validation. And that is client side yeah. validation. Uh, and uh, the only question is how you can prove that there was no double spending that there is no second copy of the paper I gave to somebody else. So you need a notary as well, so a signature of notary on that paper. You trust the notary. Here, the notary is Bitcoin blockchain. So you put the commitment into blockchain, and because we leverage the mechanism of Bitcoin, UTXO, and spending, because you bind the paper to UTXO, when the UTXO is spent, you commit to the new owner. Mm -hmm. And you can't commit just to one new owner, and you prevent double spending by that. So that's a notary for us. But one blockchain is the notary, and client-side validated data is just digital paper containing all the information. And that's why information is not in the blockchain. Yeah, this is what I uh, I mentioned this briefly before as the notion as the difference between having an obligation to trust the issuer and having the actual power to verify the information on your on your side. So client side validation actually shifts the paradigm from trusting the, the party to being able to fully validate and understand what you're holding, whether it's a real asset or it's fake, and deny the transaction. Not at the moment when you already accept, after you accepted it, and after you understood that it's, it's a scam, but at the moment of accepting. So here before, it becomes your problem, you already can verify whether it's a scam or not. Perfect. And how do you attach the, the asset to the UTXO? Like, you just say inside the asset that this UTXO is the UTXO that defines the future history of this asset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't do anything on chain. I just tell you, like, I can say, this UTXO which I control, and I don't need even to prove that I control this UTXO. And at the moment this UTXO spent means that my asset has moved. And then when I move the asset, for instance, to you, you need to verify that UTXO was spent. You don't care who owns that UTXO, mm -hmm. but you'll care to check against the promise. Mm -hmm. And when it's spent, you check that the transaction spending it commits to the fact that you are a new owner. As, as, and as a new owner, you define your own UTXO, which now controls who will the, the future of the contract. So the information in the yeah, in the information it defines the state of dates. Yes. But then it means that and these state of dates are commit into Bitcoin transactions. Yes, yeah, so my question is how do you retrieve you compute the last state? Do you have to rely on the indexing indexing node? You, you don't compute, you get the whole history as a client side data passed from me to you. So they're not passed through the blockchain. So the it's like in Lightning Network, so you communicate somehow through the relay, through the Lightning Network, through the email, through the paper, the way you want. But you have, you have to compute the state in the file. You compute it from the data that I invest into you. Okay, so it means that the data for the state is going to increase? Yes, for sure. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like with any... Mm -hmm. Are the product. So Unless you will one day we will start start using zero knowledge to compress yeah. the history. So what is the indexing node for? Yeah. Uh, it's not used in RGB. It's a Bitcoin yeah. indexing yeah. node okay. because it makes things faster. Because you still need to query a bit blockchain about the UTXOs being spent and commitments really present. Okay, so. You said that it is uh, to incomplete, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one basic attack could be like, I send you a, a state update that does an infinite loop. Uh, infinite loop is not possible because it has a, it's a bounded by the number of execution steps it can last at most. 
So you can't, uh, there, there is a restriction of uh, 60 million operations okay. per state transition. Then if I want to, I don't know, show, show LGBT to someone, what are the resources right now I can find? Like, is there any playground to issue tokens? I know there is uh, an Iris wallet made by another company that you can, you can issue on testnet token. Is there any resources where you, we can play with? Well, right now there is uh, an RGB.tech website, which has an installation um, process described. So and issuance and everything. And issuance and everything, yeah. So you go to the RGB.tech, there is a lot of information which is enough for understanding the basics of RGB. And then there is the installation page. And basically, there you have a step-by-step -step guide on how you download the information, the, the packages and everything, how you can issue the assets, how you can transfer them, receive them, etc., etc. So it's on RGB. Well, there is a red, um, yellow button. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, so it's, it's yeah. very good. Yeah. And if you click it, you have this for users installing, issuing tokens, using RGB contracts for developers, writing contracts, integrating learning and so on. Mm. Of course, when the uh, version 0 0.10 will be added to the wallets, uh, my Citadel included, because there are a couple of other wallets that have been working on RGB support as well, it will become easier. You will have more user-friendly interfaces to play around with RGB. Yeah. But again, um, from the start, it will be basically just playing around with RGB, because, for example, you cannot issue any serious assets from your mobile phone. It's kind of stupid. If you need to issue an asset, you need to sit down, have your laptop, have your notary, maybe your co-founders, blah, blah, blah. So it's a very important thing to do. So there will be more playgrounds. Right now, the most robust one is on the RGB.tech, and there will be more, more of them with the support of the version 0.10. Thanks. Is there any exchange that would uh, accept your tokens in order to, to create some trades or trades directly on, on on Bitcoin for another token, or may I buy some French franc uh, with uh, Bitcoin through your this technology? Is it possible or not? Well, Bitfenix has been a very good supporter of RGB technology, so Bitfenix is very interested in. Uh, issue in Tether, RGB, and probably with time they might be interested in adding other to RGB based tokens to it. Uh, if you want to check how many how many tokens there are publicly available, which is very important, so those people who want their token their RGB tokens to be issued and to be publicly known, uh, we will release the RGBX.io. It's the RGB asset explorer of sorts. And you would be able to go there and to see it would be something like point market app. Okay. Where you can go, you can see the information that about the asset that is publicly available again. Yeah, and it also will be listed in exchanges. And it also will be listed in exchanges and the, the rates and everything like that. And uh, the, the Bitfinex uh, probably will take some time to add RGB because they would, you know, they're, they're not fast. Uh, but, uh, there is another project that tries to implement the exchange, at least to each we know, when they will be ready, we will also add some information about them to the... Uh, so, soon. <laughs> Two weeks. Okay. Yeah. I guess the Swiss franc uh, stablecoin will be on. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So, the, the, the red Bitcoin stablecoin and Bitcoin yeah. later will be... Can the, you talk a bit about the... Interoperability in a contract and token inside the RGB. With the... Inside. Like if I create two, two tokens, can they yeah. interact in some way? Yes, uh, there is ways how they can interact. Mm -hmm. So you can introspect from the virtual machine the state of other contracts, mm -hmm. but you need to know about that contract, about its existence to interact with that. Uh, there is uh, an idea we have like blocking one asset on the other contract and so on, but uh, it's not in the current version because of the risks of the 
uh, it, it significantly increases the attack surface. So you can, until you can formally prove that it's uh, safe, we decided not to go with that for now. But it's not required because, again, you can introspect the state. You can make one conference dependent on the state of the other conference. Okay. And one of the things that is usually difficult with a UTXO-based mm -hmm. token is that you, you have a UTXO that is owned by some key in some way. So you, it's very hard to make something like a public contract in Ethereum that anyone can call. Like if you want to create an IMM, you need anyone to be able to, to call it, right? Yeah, there, there is such thing. Uh, it's called uh, state extensions and balances that uh, which can be used by a public uh, to interact with the contract. Okay. So, so it was possible to put that into a UTXO based model as well. By extending the. Yes. The system. Yes. Okay. Uh, just uh, if I create an IMM in uh, RGB, why this IMM will be, uh, will be uh, more secure uh, than a uh, contract in Ethereum? Or another option would be good. Why it would be more secure? Uh, more secure. More secure. More secure. Uh, well, not, sorry, uh, not necessary. Uh, the, the main thing that it's not, it's, it is more secure, but more important that it prevents the front running because with the client side validation, nobody knows what's, what's happening. There is no miners involved, there is no blockchain state involved. Uh, this is the first thing, and the second, it would be much cheaper and faster because it would be operating on Lightning Network, not on the chain level. So this actually results in, in a higher security. And also another point of the higher security is that uh, in RGB, this uh, virtual machine which is used in the smart contracts is formally verifiable. So it's not stack-based, it's register-based, it's uh, very deterministic, uh, so you can reason about uh, the contract qualities in a much more efficient way than in Ethereum. Because in Ethereum you need to make sure that each uh, method of the contract do not forget to match uh, to list who is uh, uh, who has the right to call this method. Because one of the main hacks is that uh, somebody who don't supposed to call this method, they call the method and kill the contract and take the funds. In RGB, this is much easier to analyze because all the rights under the contract belong to certain UTXOs. So you can't create a contract method which is which can affect the state and not being bound to a UTXO. Even with the state extensions, this uh, thing. Uh, I do execute the state extension, but the moment when it becomes real is the moment when I transfer what I have did to another party, and I'm doing that through UTXO. And then the moment you verify, and if I did something wrong, you just not accepting that, and nobody accepting that from me, so the state extension I have created is void, because it's like only I know about it, and I can't make it a, a real part of the contract history. So because all the rights are bound to UTXOs, it's really, you can't forget to list who has the right to call this method because it's always bound to UTXO and whoever has the right to spend that UTXO, he has the right to call that method. Mm -hmm. So it's easier to analyze formally the safety properties of the contract. Is it possible in a RGB smart contract to uh, get data from external things like API and stuff like that? In Ethereum, is like Oracle? Yeah, you can have Oracles, but Oracles, uh, yeah, well, you have the same structure with Oracles, okay. plus DLCs. Okay. Okay. What is DLCs? Uh, this great plot contracts, uh, yeah. the adapter signature based Oracles. Which are possible even on Bitcoin layer and in Lightning. Okay, okay. So you don't need even any complex logic. You use the signature and scriptless scripts to mm. to to do the work. Okay. So I'm a bit confused because you said RGB sits on top of Lightning and then Lightning on top yeah, of Bitcoin. Yeah, that's so one of the, the most confusing <laughs> topics. No, but UTXO is like two levels down, right? Like before. So I mean, the ownership of the UTXO is. I think the whole layerization uh, 
story approach. is a bit approach is a bit wrong. Like it's not working that way. So there is uh, layers of Bitcoin consensus, which are just two. The layer one is blockchain, and the layer two is state channels. And it's not Lightning Network; it's state channel of or Lightning Channel. And uh, both of them operate with Bitcoin transactions. So transaction, Bitcoin transaction exists in both of them. And how they differ, why they are layers, because they differ in the way they structure the security. The consensus is the layer one, the lightning channel, state channel, is the layer two, because it's not yet mined, but it can be formally provable to be mineable. So that's the layers, and there is no RGB there. Mm -hmm. Now, when we come to RGB, RGB is based on Bitcoin transaction, which may exist on any of those layers. But on top of that RGB, you have a lightning network as a network between state channels, which we should know about the RGB. So mm -hmm. that's why like RGB sticks into the lightning network, splitting it into state channels and the network part, which is on top. So that's kind of why layerization is not exactly the, mm -hmm. the thing that works. So yeah, even in Ethereum, we have some issues with uh, people being able to front run orders on IMMs. And what I understand from your state extensions, uh, there, there must be in some way a time stamping system to, to order them, right? Uh, you have to change the way you think about the smart contracts uh, with the client-side validation program because it's not working uh, with a strict analogy to Ethereum. Okay. So, in many cases, you actually do not need a smart contract. Uh, and to a big extent, part of IMM is not so much RGB-based as Lightning-based. Because uh, if you try to trade with me, so for instance, I'm a node of the decentralized exchange and doing the trade, and you're trying to interact uh, with me, you just ask me the price, and you create HTLC which, for, which forces me to use that price. So the only thing RGB adds here is the asset. So now you can do the trading because you have not just a Bitcoin, but more assets. So you are not actually doing the MM in RGB, you're doing IMM in Lightning using RGB for hosting assets. And there is no smart contract code which you are calling. You are calling the RPC of the Lightning node or P2P uh, uh, API for the other Lightning node. And you are doing Lightning payment, that's it. Uh, and that's why it's very, very different. But for instance, if you would like to do a a liquidity pool where you will have a um, uh, uh, trustless uh, relations with those who bring the liquidity, then you would need additionally to multi-peer lightning channel, also an RGB contract, which will state all the requirements of interaction between these peers as a part of the liquidity pool. So it's on the other side of RGB. But there, uh, there is no front running. Problem because it's liquidity pool, like it operates as a whole from the point of view of external world in, in, in case of trading. So, with a front running problem on the DEX side, there is no front running because only you, as a node, sees the payment and you either execute it or not, and that's it. Okay. So, you, you would do that if, like a multi sig in Lightning? Like, it's not even a lightning is already multi sig, yeah. so it's it's just a lightning. Okay. A uh, bit quick question. Uh, in your opinion, why does um, the color coin doesn't work? It was a good idea at the beginning. It was in the protocol. There is some bits, and during ten years, there is no use case for this. Well, blockchain doesn't work. It's not Nothing on blockchain can work. Yes, it's not scalable. Okay. So this would be excessive for this yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Ethereum was also not working on blockchain level. Because of cryptocurrencies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there be no utility, right? Huh? There will be no utility. Well, you can see, there is a utility, but it's not scalable utility. Like, uh, uh, one of the explanations I had to Ethereum back in the days that is Ethereum is the world computer where the whole world have just a single keyboard to type in. <laughs> <laughs> You mean it doesn't work? <laughs> <laughs>
except <laughs> except for consensus. That, that's your point. Well, I mean, it doesn't work for retail cases and real world usage. Scale, scale of usage that that right. way. So it, it does work, but it doesn't scale to the level such that it would get adopted. Uh, Ethereum had more power because it, it, it is uh, why why what didn't happen on color point has happened on Ethereum. Well, this is because of Turing uh, completeness. Okay. Because like there is no much interesting about color points. Uh, these days, yes, people are getting crazy mm -hmm. about everything, like ordinals, and but I, I don't see anything interesting, better, interesting there. Like, it's, <laughs> yeah. So you think uh, one of the layers who cannot uh, solve the scalability problem on Ethereum? Uh, Rollups, uh, potentially yes, but. Uh, the current state of things is that they are even more centralized than the Ethereum layer 1. So, of course, they will solve the scalability problem uh, with a trade-off of, of, create, of creating a decentralization problem. <laughs> and it's very easy to solve scalability problems. PayPal solved it like 10 decades ago. Like, just put a central server, <laughs> there is no scalability issues. <laughs> That's, yeah, and you also kill the interoperability because when you start to have rollups and uh, and sharding, then to interact with within shards, uh, I mean within two shards, yeah. then it becomes. Yeah, yeah, there, there are also yeah, the, the, like be. theoretically, as they are sold, the key rollups looks like real promising thing. But the, the important thing is how it would work at the end of the day in practice, because like Ethereum was also sold originally as a world computing doing everything. From what I'm saying, seeing from the what we have today in case of the, the uh, in case of rollups, is that they are centralized and the whole power of Turing completeness on EVM with a zero knowledge is theoretically achievable. There are already cases where it works, but we don't know how it will work in practice with this, when it will be scaling. And uh, there are concerns that it might not scale. So I don't know would it solve the problem. Maybe it would. I don't know. But I have some doubts and skepticism about that. Well, in this regard, it's a good thing that we have RGB because RGB is kind of like sharding done right. Because again, as a concept, sharding is a pretty good concept. Implementation so far sucks. In the theorem world, because it's like it can be done, but it probably will, it can be done as well with a lot of trade offs that will backfire in a very, very painful way to every single user out there. So, in, in RGB, we basically created the charging dinner problem. So, yeah, people, people will have an alternative to move to in case everything goes down the drain there. UTXO is like already charging at the highest level possible in some way. Yeah, and so in RGB, smart contract is, 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 is a later chart. Yeah. By, by the fact. But actually, your part is even that because you don't see ever, in many cases, in most of the cases, you ever don't see the whole history of the smart contract. You see only the part of the history which is related to the assets or the state that you own mm -hmm. on your ETX source, and the rest is hidden from you. Mm. Which is actually very mm. useful in real case scenarios as well, because for example, if uh, we if we can say that there are ten people that own some kind of asset, a collectible, which is worth like millions of dollars or whatever, and police comes or some of the government pressures one party, one person, or one organization holding the token, even if this organization exposes the information they have on the asset, it doesn't compromise everyone else. Because they literally don't have anything to give. They don't have the other information. They don't have other pieces of the puzzle. So you're still, as a part of asset holder, uh, community, I, I want to say, you're still kind of secure from, from this. Any question? Yeah. Or, All right. for a second. <laughs> uh, would you say the consensus, the consensus mechanism properly serves to distribute Bitcoin blockchain? No, well, Bitcoin blockchain plus RGB specific consensus rules, which existing outside of Bitcoin realm. So it's kind of two independent consensus, well, two 
consensus is one of which depends on the other, but it also has things which are independent from the other. So it's it's spreading a complex story at the end of the day. Drinks? Drinks, <laughs>